When you think about the ones that don't have, the, the 200 million people that have no continuous water, the 450 million that don't have access to sanitation, uh, it's just horrendous. Right. And then facing a pandemic in which the first line of defense is hand washing and knowing that there's a, a great amount of people that don't have continuous water uh, and then facing the effects of climate change and droughts and floods. And the first thing that people want is to establish the access to water and, and, and access to safe sanitation. So those are the first two priorities for the bank. Welcome to Distilled, conversations with global water leaders. Distilled is brought to you by Katian, and I'm your host, Will Sarney, CEO of Water Foundry and founder and general partner of Water Foundry Ventures. During each episode, we'll be speaking to global water leaders solving wicked water problems. We'll discuss their career, their current perspective on the water sector, and what the future might hold. Our guest today and my longtime friend, not old, uh, <laughs> is Sergio Campos, uh, Chief Water and Sanitation Division Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, Sergio, always wonderful to see you, and you always dress impeccably well. <laughs> it's inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, Will, likewise. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what a great honor to talk to somebody like you, uh, whom I've known for such a long time. Uh, and done such wonderful things, studying in seaweed and innovation and so many other things. And you're always, always impeccably dressed, dressed as well, too. <laughs> I, you know, Sergio, I think we're done with the podcast right now. Uh, you know, we'll just end it there. But uh, it, no, sincerely, it's it's really great to have you on. It, it's wonderful that you're our, our first guest on this. I think it's a, a perfect way to kick things off. Uh, in this discussion with global leaders, and you certainly filled the bill there. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about your journey. You know, how did you get into the water industry? And then also, you know, how do you define the water industry? And this is a conversation I see coming up more and more where, you know, professionals like us sort of wonder if there are really any boundaries on, on the world of uh, water and, and what the industry looks like. So if you could just tell us a little bit about how you got hooked on water? Well, I was, I was born and raised in La Paz, Bolivia. And then, as you probably know, Bolivia doesn't have the highest coverage of water and sanitation. So despite the fact that I was, that I lived in La Paz, which is the capital, the, one of the capitals of Bolivia, um, and they have, despite the fact that they have good uh, access to, to water, it was not uncommon for for me to sometimes experience a shortage of water. My mother sort of uh, holding water in the tap so that we can we can use it, uh, or going to the countryside and then uh, not have access to sanitation. And as a kid, then you wonder why and and what's the difference. So that's where it started. Then later on, uh, I I was uh, educated with the Jesuits. And the judges always make you go to the to, to, to the field, to the countryside, so that you can experience yeah. what is there. Uh, and then you could also see that, I mean, women uh, are barging water for their own, and not everybody has access to, to, to sanitation. Uh, and then later on, I'm an economist by, by, by training. Uh, I joined a private equity firm uh, through the bank, so the, through the private arm of the bank. And one of the main, the first jobs that I had was to do equity evaluation of four public utilities. And that's when, that's where I really got booked. And then all the empirical knowledge or experiences that I had on water resonated on me. Uh, and I, and I saw how important working in water and sanitation was to improve the well-being of the population. So, so that's what really hooked me in. Later on, uh, there was an opening at the bank to be a sector specialist. I applied, I got it, and that's 23 years ago. And ever since, I've been working <laughs> water and sanitation. It, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I hear this often, 
how water you know started as a, a sort of very personal connection for someone whether they you know were active in supplying water to communities that didn't have it or whether they grew up in a community that did not have uh, safe drinking water or reliable drinking water and then they they find their way almost regardless of their technical background sort of going back to really trying to solve something that is, is very personal and and in some ways, Sergio, I, I think that's, you know, sort of a perfect segue into what is the water industry? And the reason I ask is that more and more uh, that is coming up in the conversation. And I, I almost think we need to sort of broaden the definition. It's really about humanity's relationship with water and water and ecosystems as opposed to it's, you know, it's got these firm boundaries around it. It just seems to be more expansive. I, what, what do you think about that? I mean, you, you, you know, been in the sector for a long time and, uh, you know, obviously done a lot of really interesting things. So. Sure. I mean, it's going to sound like cliche, but, but I really mean it though. No, I mean, there's no life without water. Water is everything. Uh, it's in the, in the, in the, in the food that we eat, in the things that we drink in the in the things that we use to do our things from uh, a bottle of water that needs 1.4 liters of water to be produced to a glass of water that needs water to be produced and water is essential for life it's essential for life i mean it's established that without water you cannot survive um so what I mean water is everything i mean for for me it's 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 in every single thing that we do uh, yeah i you know living in the same world that you do, but coming at it from a different perspective. I, you know, it's not a cliche. I, I, in fact, I, I really wonder if we should be framing water as a uh, critical resource issue exactly the way you did, which is we, we can't do anything without water and we need to value it, uh, you know, appropriately and really start thinking about it as something that drives every aspect of our lives uh, from you know recreation to you know health and economic development and and so on sergio in you know in where you sit uh with idb uh what do you what do you think are some of the biggest challenges you know the, the sort of classic question is what what keeps you up at night um but honestly what keeps you up at night and what do you believe we all need to solve with respect to water, you know, coming at it uh, as an economist and engaging in uh, infrastructure development? I mean, it's uh, access uh, to start with. I, mean, I think it has to be the number one priority when the millennial development goals came to to its to its end, everybody was applauding for the fact that <laughs> Latin America had reached uh, or provided water and sanitation to close to 200 million people in water and in sanitation, which is one third of the Latin American population. But when you think about the ones that don't have the, the 200 million people that have not continuous water, the 450 million that don't have access to sanitation, uh, it's just horrendous. Uh, right. And then facing a pandemic in which the first line of defense is hand washing, and knowing that there's a, a great amount of people that don't have continuous water, uh, and then facing the effects of climate change and droughts and floods, and the first thing that people want is to establish the access to water and, and, and access to safe sanitation. So those are the first two priorities for the bank. Uh, we're working closely with governments to bridge the access gap. Uh, to the ones that don't have access to safe water, to the ones that ha don't have access to continuous water and uh, and sanitation as well, as well as uh, fighting the effects of climate change. Uh, Latin America is very privileged in having water, but uh, on the news, we're always uh, facing challenges for droughts or for floods. I, it, that, that's a really interesting perspective. You know, it it, it seems like we do make progress, you know, we advance forward and we do, I don't want to say congratulate ourselves, but acknowledge that yes, you know, all this hard work from diverse stakeholders has, has moved us along. Uh, do you think 
the realization of how severe the impacts of climate change are on the hydrologic cycle and infrastructure in some ways has set us back a little bit in our progress? Or are we just learning more about a very complex interaction between climate change and, and water? It's slowing the growth. In many cases, it's sending us back uh, and sort of undoing the, 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 the little progress that we've done. And we've seen that in, in through many hurricanes, through many floods. And, and we always tell uh, in Latin America, there's no reason why a drought should de- be the equivalent of water scarcity or a fraud should be the equivalent of economic loss or, or life loss. It's inadequate management of the water and sanitation. And yes, climate change is uh, holding us back and it's making our work harder. The little progress that we make then needs to be rebuilt. Right. It, it almost feels at times, you know, two steps forward and one step back, as they say. Um, and, you know, I, it always strikes me that the more we learn, the more complicated all of this becomes. You know, it's 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 never simple. It, it's always a challenge. Uh, it is a wicked problem that we're all really trying to solve. Uh, and I, I really do love how you framed it in terms of, yeah, we've made progress. So 200 million people, you know, more have access to safe drinking water. But it's kind of binary. It, it only matters, you know, where it matters the most if you don't have it you're you're not one of those what do you you know it, we, we both were at UN Water Week what what did you learn from that incredibly diverse uh, group of stakeholders that uh, are engaged in the in the world of water uh, you know very differently I mean what I was amazed by the enthusiasm this showed by every single person that was there. Uh, and then you can tell that everybody really loves what they do and they speak <laughs> passionately about it. No, I think that uh, us that are in the sector understand its complexities, understand its importance. There's not going to be, I mean, it's, it's internationally known that if you don't achieve the SDG, you won't achieve better health, better education, poverty reduction, gender equality. I mean, it's established and, and everybody went and spoke uh, with, with a lot of passion and with a lot of knowledge. I celebrate the fact that uh, there was a conference water in water after 47 years. Uh, I celebrate the fact that everybody took notes that water should be part of the cause. Um, and I celebrate that um, there were a lot of commitments, despite the fact that some of the commitments were not as it rigorous or meticulous as they should have been, but there were commitments. The thing that is the, I think that the, the, the two big missing actors, which are very important, and I think that one of the most important were the public utilities, are the local authorities like governors and mayors, because they face the day-to-day problems of climate uh-huh. change, the access to water and sanitation, but I don't take it as a setback, but as a, as an opportunity to include them and involve them more because they have very intelligent things to contribute, to many important solutions that need to be replicated, copied, or amplified. I, yeah, I, I, I love how you uh, frame this as, you know, a celebration of what was good about it, what was right about it. and. I, you know, I was really struck by how diverse the stakeholders, stakeholder groups were. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I don't believe I've ever been to an event where it had that much diversity in terms of stakeholder groups and then, you know, geographic and gender diversity. Uh, it was it, it it was just so impactful for me. And, you know, I sit in a tiny little slice of the pie here. Uh so if we can replicate that going forward and, and bring in, you know, as many stakeholders that are really trying to do their best to solve water related challenges, I, I think this could be a pivotal moment in a lot of ways. And I, I love also your point about, you know, essentially water is a local issue. So it is, you know, it, cities, uh, you know, civil society, uh, you know, small, mid-sized utilities that are 
really challenged day in and day out to deliver safe drinking water when faced with, uh, you know, challenges with infrastructure and, you know, the impacts of climate change and, and so on. Uh, yeah, I, I actually walked out of there hopeful. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I'm an optim raging optimist uh, by nature, but I felt good about what I had seen uh, and, and really very positive about it. And in a lot of ways excited about, you know, Stockholm World Water Week and, you know, everything that, you know, IDB does uh, at Stockholm uh, and can see the linkage between the two. So Sergio, what, where do you see all of this headed uh, in terms of new ways of thinking about solving water, uh, delivering access to safe drinking water? Uh, you know, there's a lot of movement around digital technologies, uh, democratizing access to data, actionable information, and, uh, you know, non-centralized system. So uh, not to predict, but where do you see things going? Um, well, I'm, as, I'm like you and like most people that work in the sector, I'm also a raging optimistic. So sometimes <laughs> a little bit naively optimistic. Um, I think that climate change is going to make the progress in water and sanitation the irreversible. Because uh, countries are right. going to start facing droughts and floods like California did, like Pakistan did, like Sao Paulo had, or like uh, Cape Town had. And then, I mean, we all need water and sanitation, so we're going to have to address the problem right there. Um, we always say that there's a global, global challenge, climate change, and the solution is local because you only will be able to address it if you address it, it well local, because it affects different points of view. So I think that um, with climate change, countries, municipalities, uh, states are going to have to have a holistic responses to it, and they're going to have to allocate water resources, sort of financial resources to address the problem. And in there, I think innovation, which came late to our sector, it's here to stay. Uh, but you were mentioning non-conventional solutions like container-based sanitation, like like condominial sanitation, or that, um, different innovation or different solutions to to obtain uh, water for, for human consumption uh, are going to be part of the solution. So I think that a sector that was very conventional and very traditional in its solutions in order to address the existing problems, the short term and in the medium term, uh, art is going to have to innovate and those innovations are going to uh, uh, come to stay. I, interesting perspective. Um, it, you know, what I'm hearing is that in some ways you're seeing the uh, overlap between, you know, folks that are, fo yeah, you know, focus on solving climate and, and folks like us that are focused on solving water and, you know, biodiversity ecosystems and so on, starting to overlap. And it's it's looking more like a Venn diagram in a lot of ways. And we're acknowledging the complexity of the interrelationships, but, you know, maybe perhaps even the opportunities, you know, from a uh, innovative technology perspective, innovation in public policy and so on. And again, you know, two optimists looking at, you know, perhaps the challenges, but also seeing uh, a path forward in in all of this. What um, what would be your call to action for those folks that are listening to us right now? What would you, what's your ask to the layperson and and professionals, you know, like yourself? I we uh, we had to present the commitments from the bank, and the commitments from the bank would be the call to action that I have as uh, or that I place it first is transboundary waters uh, and through a more holistic approach 70 percent mm -hmm. of the water in latin america is in transboundary or shared or shared basins that's where occupy 60 percent of our land that's where 40 percent of our population lives uh and it, well, i mean we're responsible for for 40 percent of the world biodiversity so we, st we have to stop lo stop looking at water as a as an isolated uh, 
uh, think and look at more share the cross boundary. The second one is sanitation. The biggest challenge that we have is sanitation impact in our environment, uh, very important. And there, through non-conventional solutions, such as container base, I mean, if you, if you want to provide access to sanitation to a uh, uh, informal settlement and you want to do it traditionally, it's going to take you 15 years to do it. You have to be able to address the needs in the short-term basis. Um, and, and non-conventional solutions have to be part of the solution. So sanitation is the second one. The third one is the rural sector. We need to, th- we turn our backs to the rural sector. And in Latin America, in particular, Latin American economy depends on water for food production, for energy generation, for, for exports, from meat, flowers, to vegetables. So the rural sector that has a important gap in access to water and sanitation, we need to close that gap. We need to be able to provide them solutions. And, and fourth, but it's not the least, probably is the most important innovation. We need to innovate and innovation is not only digital or technological, it's social, it's financial, it's in governance. I, I, I love that. Uh, and it, it, you know, it, as an outsider's perspective, uh, you know, the bank does, I believe, uh, an outstanding job in terms of really being creative and being innovative and really identifying innovative, uh, not just technologies, but innovative business models to solve some of these challenges that we seem to be stuck on. So, Sergio, um, first of all, big thanks. I look forward to seeing you uh, this year again, probably at Stockholm. Uh, to our audience, encourage you to follow Distilled, uh, provide feedback. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing the series. So, Sergio, uh, always a joy to listen to you. Likewise, Will. Thanks so much, Sergio. Be well. Be well.